But I oftentimes think about like the best content that I consume, I can never find on Google today if I wanted to. All right. Uh, our guest today is the co-founder of Morning Brew, a successful founder, CEO, content creator, investor, uh, you name it. You've probably, you've probably done a million other things that I'm not listing there. Um, you've built a massive audience online for Morning Brew, but also for yourself to the tune of 200,000 plus followers on Twitter, over 100K on LinkedIn, other places as well, just a, a big audience. And then you've got this big media audience as well for your company. And you have a wildly successful podcast called Founders Journal, which I love, super easy to digest. So today I'm excited to welcome in Alex Lieberman to the show. And to start out with, I really just want to go back to you know, your very start with content, going back to your origin story. Do you remember the first time where you kind of remember thinking, I should start creating content. What was that moment like for you? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me uh, on Pump2 to, uh, to be here. Um, you know, I would say I've always kind of known I'm, I'm a creative person. Uh, I, I think back to um, in kindergarten when I would be like trying to invent new forms of pens and highlighters and literally like cutting them and pasting them together. Like I always had just like a very creative and visual brain. I would actually say that I didn't, from a content creation perspective, it was kind of the the bane of my existence for a long time in the sense that like I didn't, the content creation growing up was, you know, it wasn't Twitter, it wasn't social, it was writing essays in school. And uh I neither enjoyed that nor did I think I was very good at it. Um, and so I would say my kind of introduction to content creation happened pretty organically, right? Where uh, I was a student at the University of Michigan. It was my senior year. I had a bunch of free time and I was like, I need to do something to pass the time. And, I, and so I started spending uh, time with students in the business school of Michigan where I would do mock interviews with them. Uh, and I would always ask them in these mock interviews, how do you keep up with the business world? And every student would say, you know, I read the Wall Street Journal um, and I read it because I feel like I have to because that's what my parents told me to do. Um, and at some point I was like, this is crazy. These kids are working their asses off to have careers in business, yet they don't have content that story tells the business world uh, in a fun and engaging way. So I just started writing a newsletter. Um, at the time, it was called Market Corner. It was a Microsoft Word template that I would put together every single day after pouring the internet for you know four or five hours. Grabbed a bull and a bear fighting from Google, Im Google Images. Uh, it had the watermark on it. <laughs> Definitely wasn't allowed to use that image, but I did. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I never said to myself, "Hey, I want to be a content creator." Now it was more just like I did it part selfishly to force myself to stay up to date with the business world so that when I graduated from Michigan, I would kind of be on top of my game to go ultimately work in um, sales and trading. And then I would say part selflessly where it's like the students I was helping, they kind of just kept telling me they weren't enjoying business news and I wanted to make it better and more engaging. Uh, and so that's that was my introduction. There's a principle in there that I think is super valuable to anybody that hasn't started building their audience set or creating content where you took something complex and made it simple. And there, there is kind of this idea out there that, or, or at least there used to be, maybe not so much anymore, that you kind of have to be an expert on something to be really interesting online. And now I think that narrative has shifted to you can learn in real time and just share what you're learning in real time and either create or curate, and that's a viable way as well. So your journey has been, I would say you've probably even touched more lives, especially in content creators' lives, than you'd even think through everything Morning Brew's done, just because you look at the model and it's like, how many people were really thinking of that Morning Brew and email could become this big business? And now it's, you know, it's it's not the biggest business in the world, but it's like, really substantial. Everybody knows it. It's crazy. Does it, does that ever dawn on you how crazy it is that an email turned into this? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> the, the last seven years have been, um, you know, kind of like the most fulfilling, difficult, enjoyable, you know, like all of the adjectives. Um, it, it's been the, the most 
intense and privileged experience uh, of my life. And I would say historically I've been um, really bad at sitting back and truly appreciating uh, the impact that the brew has had. But I also think that's in a lot of ways what kept us motivated for so long was just seeing over time the number of emails in the inbox every single day just scale with the size of the audience and see how it was really helping people uh, in their everyday life. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was super fulfilling. And the one other thing I'll say, you know, uh, about principles from kind of like the early days of creating the product is you mentioned one thing um, about uh, making things digestible and kind of like the leverage that's created by just taking complex topics and breaking them down simply. And I'd say that that's absolutely um, something that we did with the brew. Um, and that, that was one of the ways we differentiated the product. But the other thing I would say is you brought up the word curation. And I think, again, ever, even today, most people feel a certain way about having to always have original ideas. And I think at the end of the day, a very simple truth, and I'm sorry if I break your heart saying this, like m very few of us ever have original ideas. Even the idea of Morning Brew is not original. We, we came up with a business newsletter. There have been other business newsletters before. Um, we packaged and remixed in a way that was different. So it was uh, unoriginally original. And so the reason I say that is curation is an amazing tool for drafting off of, honestly, the work that's been done by other people um, and doing so, obviously, in a way that you give credit to them. But also, it's such a service, right? In the, in the age of the internet where content abundance continues to accelerate because it's never been easier to create content, it is harder than ever to kind of find signal as a consumer to know what you should care about, what to look for. Um, you know, I oftentimes think about like the best content that I consume, I can never find on Google today if I wanted to, right? Like if I looked 100%. up the stuff that I wanted to find, I would never find it on Google. And so that means there's a ton of opportunity to kind of be the, the, the strainer of sorts that, that sifts through all of the shit that's on the internet. And gives a specific audience the stuff that they should actually care about. And to me, that's an invaluable service. And it's only going to get more valuable because I don't think the internet's going anywhere. A little bit further beyond the point when you just had the idea, but when you actually said, oh, I think maybe we could do this as a business or at least try, in that moment, what were kind of the things that you were looking to do? Or, well, I guess, who are, who are the people you were trying to reach? If you had to define that group with a one-liner, who was the person that you were trying to reach at that point or who your audience was, and how is that different than what it is now at Morning Brew? Yeah, I mean, so if I had to say it in one line, the original audience was the college business student. The evolved audience over time was the modern business leader, um, kind of like the emerging business leader, uh, the, the, the uh, career competitive, upwardly mobile professional who's working in a large coastal city and they're you know, mid to late twenties, who's just constantly trying to find ways to level themselves uh, up and grow as a professional. But it was a pretty kind of what I would say gradual graduation of who our audience turned into. Right when we started writing the newsletter, I think out of necessity and out of just ease, our reader was the college student who was just our peer in the business school at Michigan, right? That's the people we had access to. And then once we had felt like we saturated the Michigan market, right? Then we were basically like, okay, what do we do now? We want to keep growing, but we, there's only so many classes and clubs that we can go pitch this thing in and tell people to sign up on a piece of paper for. And so then Austin and I were like, okay, let's find other Alex's and Austin's at other colleges and have them do the same thing of going into classes and clubs, right? So the original audience went from, the Michigan business school student to the just college business student um, to the college student who should care about business. And then at some point after, you know, we had been doing our college ambassador program for a while, which was a really huge unlock for us in the early days, 
And then we were like, while we're getting emails from people who are definitely not college students, they're getting a ton of value out of this product. So how do we think about that? And to be honest with you, in the early days, it was actually kind of a very hard thing to reconcile when we saw hypothetically like a, you know, a 45 year old um, person who was well into their career reading the brew, not that uh, we look at uh, the brew in any sort of way, like of discriminate discriminating by age group, but we had created it with a certain kind of audience in mind, which was the college business student. And so a concern we had was like, is that a bad thing if someone who's like 45 and deep into their career is reading it? Is that bad? Because does that mean we're actually not writing in a simple or clear enough way for the college student who has way fewer years of experience under their belt? And you know what we came to understand is, no, actually, we were kind of writing for the established professional the whole time. And the college student, if they only understood like, 65 to 70 percent of the brew that was okay because their goal was to become the professional and so they were just constantly reading to try to get more and more out of it and so ultimately after kind of college students that's when we launched morning brews referral program which to this day uh, has been the biggest organic growth driver of subscribers for our business and that that was the unlock that took us from just serving the college business student to basically ser- serving the modern business leader, the person who has a vested interest in knowing what's going on in the business world. I talked with other people about this same thing too, how your audience evolves over time. And it's not a rigid thing because if if your audience stays rigid, that probably means that you're staying the same, you're not learning, you're not evolving. So it's it's absolutely crucial to understand the data points that are telling you when to move in a certain direction. So when you were doing the college ambassador program, especially upfront in Michigan, what were, what were the signals that maybe were indicating to you that people were or that you should like keep expanding your audience, that you should add new topics, things like that? Or, or how did you even know that what you were making was good? Did you, did people give you direct feedback? Like, how are you collecting all that info? I mean, the short answer is like, this is the really hard part about the content game. Um, because something that I think about a lot, right, is you can be very scientific about, let's just say, a software product and finding product market fit. Like you can be incredibly data driven with it because you have access to a lot of data to glean insights from. With content, you have the same goal in the early days of a media company or being a creator, which is to find content market fit, right? So this is something I think about all the time with Founders Journal. Have we reached content market fit yet? With my other podcast, Imposters, have we uh, reached content market fit yet? And in the early days of The Brew, to be honest with you, it's like even harder to tell if we had reached content market fit relative to like if you were a tech company saying, have we reached product market fit, which there still isn't like a kind of prescriptive number that you hit that you've reached product market fit. And the reason is, is you have a newsletter. You only get so much data with that newsletter. You get opens, you get clicks, and you get replies to your email. And so it's really hard, right, to be able to tell on a day-to-day basis what's resonating with people, what's not, other than kind of directionally anecdotal evidence from people responding to you saying what they like and don't like. I would think I, I would say the biggest thing for us was again, because once we had realized that the whole time we actually weren't creating, while while, while our intended target audience and call it day one, was the college business student. Once we realized that we had never actually been writing for the college business student, we were writing for the person who was, say, five years out of college, because our view was like, if we kind of write up to the the already existing professional, the emerging professional is going to hop along for the ride because they are aspirational. They want to be that 28-year-old professional. I think it made us realize that, oh, wow, we have the opportunity to serve kind of any business professional who very simply wants two things. They want to save time because they don't have a lot of time in their day, and that is true of a college student who's taking classes. That's true of a 28-year-old professional who's trying to manage a social life while having a work life, and it's true of a young parent who has two kids. All of them have scarcity of time. I would say the second thing is it's for people who want something that feels like they're like the content is as if they're having a conversation with a peer uh, who is quick witted, who is passionate about the topic, but doesn't take themselves too seriously. And to be honest with you, our view kind of turned into like 
we think most people are that way. We think most people actually just want content that doesn't feel like you're talking to a teleprompter. Um, and so that was that was kind of the big unlock for us. I think if we had started the brew from the place of writing it in a very elementary way for people who were just getting their feet wet in business, it would actually be, would have been a very a way harder transition to make to scale the audience because I think as we would have tried to get kind of more tenured professionals, they would have resisted the product, kind of feeling as if the product was simply too simple for them and it wasn't serving them in that way. And so I'd say that was kind of part intentional, uh, intentional part luck in the early days of the business to write up to the audience rather than to write down to the audience. And kind of piggybacking off off of this concept as well, you since have built out like marketing brew and, and other wings of like different topics using similar structure, but going deeper on not just money, like going, going marketing, things like that. So, um, with, with that, did you have ind- indicators that people wanted that was, were there enough replies from the, to those emails that like, Hey, we want a marketing brew or was it just, that was the direction that co- you wanted to take with the company. It was a gut yeah. feeling and it worked out. So there are a few data points. The first was basically, we were like, we have this one newsletter, all of our eggs are in one basket we not only have not diversified our revenue outside of advertising, but we haven't even diversified our, our revenue within advertising, meaning all of our advertising dollars sit within one product. And so if there ends up not being as much appetite for that product, we're screwed. That was one. The second was like, we basically said to ourselves, okay, we have all these subscribers now. How do we build a deeper relationship with, let's call it a million subscribers at the time? And we said, well, what if we just find a way to work ourselves more and more into their day-to-day jobs, into the industries they're in, into the professions they're in? So that was the second thought. And the third thought was we were aware of B2B publications, I would say generally from, honestly, Austin and I consuming a shit ton of B2B media content in the early days because, you know, again, for context, Austin and I had zero media experience. And so I remember in the early days of the brew, we were just consuming everything possible about digital media just to learn about the industry. And I think from doing that process, we quickly realized that if we thought like B2C or consumer business news was dry and antiquated, B2B business news put it to shame. It, I was just going to say that must have been like the worst time of your life doing all that B2B research. Yeah, to, 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 totally. And so I think all those data points basically said to us, oh, wow, there could be a really interesting opportunity here because we made business news fun and engaging for the for a kind of call it consumer audience. If we can make it, it even 10% more engaging for a B2B audience, one, we think it's easier to do that because B2B news is so shitty and boring right now. And two, our view was that um, there's actually more money on a subscriber basis to be made because on the B2B side, our view is advertisers would be willing to pay more per subscriber to get in front of a specific job function, to get in front of a marketer, to get in front of someone who works in retail versus just getting in front of a general uh, professional audience, right? Like it played into a thesis that niche media was generally more valuable and that we would never try to get more general than the daily newsletter. And the only other thing I'll say is like, we have the same kind of mental model today of what uh, B2B verticals we launch at the brew as when we started. It's a combination of, is, is there enough news flow in a given job function or industry to, uh, to be able to support at least a three day a week B2B newsletter. Second, um, is there a sizable enough audience in this vertical that we think it could end up being an eight-figure business? Like with all of our B2B verticals, our hope is that all of them could be eight-figure businesses in their own right. And on that second one about audience, we also always thought to ourselves, not only is the audience big enough, but do we have a lot of them in our existing daily newsletter audience so we can kind of have a very large built-in audience on day one? And the third was, is there a depth of advertiser? Is there a large depth of advertisers who want to get in front of this specific audience so it doesn't feel like we're always trying to just kind of grab dollars from the same three or four companies? And so, you know, fast forward today, we have 
marketing brew. Uh, we have retail brew. We have emerging tech brew. We have HR brew. We have IT brew, CFO brew. Um, and our view is that there are going to be more verticals to launch. But actually, we think as much as it's important to kind of move horizontally and extend our surface area in B2B, going vertically is actually as much of a focus, right? So these, these verticals now, uh, take Marketing Brew, for example, aren't just newsletters. It's newsletters, it's events. So we have like a robust events business now for industry professionals. We launched our first job board and we're actually launching sub-industry verticals. So I'm sure that you saw like Jack Appleby is working at The Brew now and we've kind of taken this creator model that we're using on the B2C side and we think it is as applicable to the B2B side where actually within our given industries or job functions, individuals can be kind of effectively content creators and influencers where we build businesses around them in given uh, given verticals. I, I wish that this would have existed a long time ago. Like it's cool that it does now, but it took a long time to get to this place where creators really like rule a lot of the internet. And it's cool. Totally. It's I, I love it. I love where we're at now. And I I'm grateful for companies like like Morning Brew keeping it going. But even with so with you, there's the Morning Brew side, but then you also like you're trying to build your own thing. And I'm yep. sure that one of the main drivers is that you want to help grow Morning Brew still, but there's still this side of it that's like it's good to have your own thing. You want to have your own personal brand. So the differences between building a personal brand versus building a brand for a media company must be pretty drastic. And I'd, I'd love to just pick your brain on what, what those key differences are, how you approach it differently. Like if you were just a one man show, but still building morning brew right now, how would that still look different than creating your own content? Yeah. I mean, to be honest, like I think creating content uh, and to talk about that specifically, you know, what does that look like for me? I would say that's creating Content uh, and threads on Twitter. It's creating some content on Instagram and TikTok, like especially short form video content, which I've gotten into. Um, it's creating Founders Journal, um, which I'm actually in the process of evolving right now and kind of like pivoting it um, to, I think, better hone in on uh, content market fit. And then it's Imposters, which is my show that basically focuses on world class professionals uh, and performers and deep struggles or traumas that they've had in their lives and how they've navigated them while still being successful. And why do I do that? And how is it different from the brew? Well, I would say the, the reason I do it is there's a few reasons. One is because I genuinely enjoy it. Um, I, I really love creating content. Um, and it's such an ironic thing to say because, like I said early in my life, I fucking hated it, but I really love it. And I don't think I, it actually took me a while to realize I love it because a lot of times when you do something you love, you're not actually actively saying to yourself, I love it. It's like you just do it and you do it mindlessly and you do it without complaining. It's, it's more of like creating content is something that I kind of do an autopilot because I just enjoy it. Um, so I enjoy creating content. I would say the second reason is, you know, at this point, feel incredibly lucky to be in a spot where Morning Brew has grown a lot, right? We have 260 employees. We have, um, you know, more than 15 products. And so in some ways, it doesn't feel like a startup anymore, at least from what I get to touch. And I love the ground floor of things. And so to me, creating content, building my personal brand, launching shows like Founders Journal and Imposters, it's, uh, it's, it kind of puts me back at the ground floor. It makes me almost feel like I'm working on a micro startup again. Um, because to, you know, just to use the example of, um, of Imposters, right? We're like 15 episodes into this thing. We're getting single digit thousand downloads uh, an episode like this, th this is not a huge show yet. And to me, part of the adrenaline rush is thinking about how do we achieve content market fit as fast as humanly possible by being partly data driven, partly driven by gut, um, and having both a, a content mindset, but also a growth mindset of, okay, how do we make our episodes as good as possible? But also how do we think about all the possible distribution channels that we can get this show in front of? And so 
That's part of the reason. And then the third piece is I actually think creating content myself helps me be a better partner to my co-founder, Austin, and to the rest of the business in kind of being an idea generator for where we go from here. Because as Morning Brew doubles and triples down on bringing creators onto our platform, I've, I genuinely just believe that it would be very hard to kind of understand creators, to work with creators, and to kind of, in a way, build offerings for creators if we didn't, if kind of one of us wasn't a creator ourselves. And I just think it, it, um, it helps me empathize with the journey of creators who we ultimately bring to the brew. Yeah, I love that because that's that's not really the path that most companies are going to take anyway. Most companies are not going to have too many executives posting content out there. There's they're too busy to do that stuff, and yeah, uh, you know it's it's a lot of playing it safe, not taking risks type of thing. So with what you're doing, I think there's a, a big example in there for people listening. And I am also a little bit curious, like if you were just starting out here again, like starting completely from scratch, I guess I'll let you take the knowledge you have now, but you, you've got nothing to your name anymore uh, other than your knowledge. If you're just starting out, do you think you would focus more on the content that you just personally want to create or more on the content that's based on like audience research and what other people have said there's demand for? It's kind of one of those things of like, what do you spend your time working on, right? And I think it's the, this intersection of like, um, what do you enjoy? What are you good at? And what do people want? And I think it's actually a similar exercise for content, right? So it's like, what what are areas of content that you think you enjoy? Uh, what are areas of content that people want? And what are areas of content uh, that you think you would uh, you have something, some unique knowledge or insight that makes you good at creating that content. And I think the intersection there is where things become interesting, right? So I think the example is, let, let's just, let's just say I was starting from scratch and I'll, I'll give an example. Like, um, I'm into golf. Like I, I really enjoy golf. And so if I'm thinking to myself, I could see myself just anytime I go to the range, uh, anytime I'm on the course creating golf content, because I assume there's a lot of other people who are trying to learn, like become better golfers like I am. Um, one, I need to kind of figure out a way to validate if that's true. But to be honest, I think it's hard in the beginning to validate, okay, how am I going to find out if human beings are interested in kind of like following the journey golf content? I think it's more the belief that if I'm interested in this, and this is like a national sport, there are going to be other people interested in this. And I think it's about understanding how much content is already out there about by golfers around the process of improving in golf. And if you don't think there's a lot of content out there, to me, that's the example of like, okay, I play golf. I've played for a while. I'm looking to improve. Uh, I think I, I don't think there's a lot of content out there about it. And I think people want it because they don't feel like there's a lot of places they can turn other than a professional to look for golf instruction. And so to me, that feels like an interesting and ripe area to me. And so then the kind of the second piece becomes, okay, what is going to be my unique point of view and where is that going to occur, right? So how do I create content around my journey of becoming a better golfer that is unique in nature and feels like only Alex Lieberman could have created content around it? Maybe it's, um, you know, maybe it is because of my network, it's the combination of uh, some content is me on the course, but some content is actually getting professional golfers instru or instructors to provide commentary on my swing uh, at, in the form of video. Like it's what whatever my unique point of view is, I think that's important to think about. And the second thing to think about is like, where does this content live? So what is the best way to express kind of like content that relates to the journey of getting better at golf? And also, where does my intended audience live? And to be honest, it's going to be hard to know that in the early days. So it's more of me asking myself, if I'm currently looking for, call it, instructional golf content, where am I going? My answer is probably, I'm going to start a golf vlog on YouTube because that's where people are probably going. And yeah, my follow-up question for you there would be then, so I, I, I agree with you that... Um, when you're, when you're just creating, create what you think is interesting. And then you have to go out and 
validate that after the fact because it's really hard to just make assumptions based on a couple different tools online. Yep. Uh, when, once you get to that point, there's there's a lot that goes into the validation. Maybe we can come back to that as well because I'm interested in your thoughts on idea of validation. But if um, if you were to start the Morning Brew experiment like back at Michigan, but yep. you started it as a YouTube channel instead, do you think that you would have succeeded? Or do you think that the medium had to be that at that moment? I think the reason we didn't even think about video at the time is because it felt like the hurdle to create great video content was so much more daunting and so much higher. And we already felt limited in the fact that we weren't like professional writers. For us to be like, okay, now we not only have to write scripts, we need to video those scripts, we need to learn Adobe Premiere, we need to edit those, we need to learn how to think about YouTube as a platform. It just... It honestly, the thought didn't even cross our mind. So I think the answer would have been no, because I don't think that, like, I think what made Aust- uh, this work was definitely a lot of luck and definitely kind of an eye for what in text conversational content looked like. And I, I don't know that we had kind of that eye in video. I think it takes a longer period of time to train that eye. Um, and again, like the reason we chose email was it was cheap and we knew, uh, our peers were consuming content or, or they use their email on a daily basis. And so like, that's why YouTube wasn't even a, a thought at the time. Cause like now, you know, today it feels like everyone consumes content on YouTube at the time. I didn't watch YouTube content. Austin watch Austin didn't watch YouTube content. And it wasn't kind of in our consideration set that like our peers were watching YouTube content. So um, no, I don't think it would have been successful, both because I don't think we had the we were equipped with any of the tools to possibly have an advantage. And because I don't think a lot of the students in our school went to YouTube for the type of content we were creating for people. And, and interestingly, you wouldn't have collected email addresses either. So you wouldn't have owned any of that. Um, exactly. That's, you would have that's had to push them from YouTube. Other and, and so the business side of it would have not been nearly as rapid until you figured out the rest of it. But all that to say, I'm, I was just interested in that because I think format matters. I think the medium totally. does matter. And if you're whoever's listening to this right now, if you're like questioning, should I do a YouTube channel or a podcast or should I do Twitter or whatever? I think the correct answer typically is whatever you feel like you can get off the ground today and then stick with for a while. And then you can always expand. There's nothing stopping you from expanding. But like I try, I've tried doing all the channels at once and that totally failed, became super overwhelming. And then you focus on one thing and you stick at it long enough, you can figure it out yeah. and then move on to the next. I, I think at the end of the day, so much of it is just giving yourself a fighting chance to en- enjoy creating content for a long period of time because you can bet it's going to take a long time. Uh, you know, he, it's the cliche example, but like Mr. Beast has been creating content on YouTube for, I want to say like, 13 years at this point. Um, Something like that, yeah. A, a, and, you know, he didn't really see success. Like he, he's provided kind of like a breakdown timeline wise of when he got his first million views. Um, and it took many years. And if you go back to his original videos, like I don't know if you've ever gone to his old videos, but his mm-hmm. first videos ever were like him playing Minecraft and like the videos were dog shit. But like he enjoyed doing it. He became obsessed with the platform and he just got incrementally better on a day-to-day basis. And the nice thing, by the way, about YouTube versus, say, email is you actually get a fair, like far more data about your audience that can help inform the content, I think, in a better way than email. But yeah, to me, it's like, it is such a long game that you need to give yourself a fighting chance that you're going to enjoy it. Um, and so on one hand, I think you should pick a medium that where you think you're, the audience for the content you're creating is likely going to be. But I think you should also pick a, a type of content that you think you'll enjoy creating. Because I know plenty of people who write newsletters who absolutely hate creating shorter, long-form video and vice versa. Um, and so to me, it's like, yeah, at the end of the day, you just you really got to enjoy it. And by the way, if you don't enjoy creating content, that's okay too. There are other ways to create value and build network in life. Like, While I think there's a ton of... Um, advantage created by being a creator. Being a creator is not for everyone because again, it takes a lot of time. It can be emotionally exhausting and not everyone likes creating content and that's okay. Yeah. I mean, again, some people like 
actively creating. Some people like curating, which is also a form of creation that takes a lot. It still takes something. It, it requires effort and it is valuable. So you can be just as helpful there. Uh, maybe you don't. There are a lot of people on Twitter, for example, that just build things, but they don't really totally. create a ton of content. And they're awesome. They create really cool stuff on, that's not content. They're like apps and things like that. So you can provide value in a lot of different ways. And by the uh, way, wanna, what, one yeah. other thing I'll say is like, also, if, if you get far enough in your career, um, especially in like if you're working on a business and you realize the importance of content creation, but you don't personally enjoy doing it, right? Like this is where I think there's quality systems to create in the sense that like, you know, Gary V has a, I don't know how many people are on his brand team now. But it's a crazy amount of people to a million dollars in payroll a year, something insane. And you know, this guy is like he 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 does enjoy creating content, but a lot of times he's not the one creating the content. He's not the one capturing the content. He's going to absolutely have input. But a lot of times you, you'll see his videos where it's either him uh, after a conference talk, giving advice to someone and someone on his team who is like his producer editor is capturing that is turning that captured thing into four clips. It's either that, or it's literally from 10 years ago of him creating content, YouTube content for wine library. And they built such a good machine of somehow having that content logged and sharing it 10 years later. And so what I'll say is like, you also don't necessarily need to be kind of always the, the button pusher, um, of content, you can also build a system around yourself. Like someone who I think does this very well is uh, Ryan Serhant, uh, the uh, real estate agent. Um, he he has a team, a media and content team around him that's creating awesome content around kind of his journey of of building a very large real estate agency. But at, again, I don't think he's the button pusher. I think he has set up the right system. Yeah, and that that's important for a lot of the uh, the founders listening here too. If you totally. Wanna, if you don't feel like you have time, systems are the way to go. Um, going back to this idea of idea validation, just a little bit. One thing that that I found in my journey, I want to kind of pick your brain on. If you post something that's really great, it can be pretty easy to make assumptions on why, because people you'll get good engagement. People tell you stuff. On the flip side, if you make something really bad. Uh, people will also tell you a lot of the time that it's really bad or you'll just get nothing on it. I find that one of the the hardest things is when you get, when you create something that's okay and, and you often don't know really what to make of that. So if you, if let's say that I've created a piece of content that's kind of just okay, how am I supposed to know? Uh, how How am I supposed to glean insights from that for my audience and like, what's the process to take that from okay to great after that? Like, have you seen that with morning brew? Have you ever posted something that turned out to just be, that's fine. And how did you, how did you actually know that it wasn't good enough? Oh yeah. All the time. I mean, my view is there's kind of, there's two ends of the spectrum on kind of how content creators go about putting out content. Uh, I would say it's kind of people who are point and shoot and people who are kind of, spray and pray uh, on kind of like opposite sides of the spectrum. So, you know, an example I'll use is like Sahil, right? Sa- Sahil Bloom, um, he is very much point and shoot. Like Sahil is putting out, I, I mean, I don't follow his like feed religiously, but my guess is he's putting out two tweets a day, maybe. Um, but he's incredibly intentional about every tweet he puts out and driving engagement with that tweet. Um, for me, I would actually say I'm a little bit more spray and pray. And I would say I'm that way because that's how my brain works. And I think, uh, rather than resisting kind of the crazy brain that I have, I just embrace it. And when I have a thought, you know, I spend a little bit of time refining the idea, but I put it out into the world. And my view is directionally over time by getting signals from people of what's working and not working. I'm going to kind of mentally make these adjustments that get me more and more engagement over time. Uh, so I would say to your question of like when th- something's just okay, uh, how do like what do you do with that? The reason I bring that up is it depends on what your goals are, right? Like for some people, just okay is not how they want to kind of carry their online brand for someone who's more point and shoot, where just okay for someone who really is like, actually just trying to have a waterfall of content 
it's more acceptable to them. The other reason I'll say it's based on your goals is there are things that I create that I know are going to get just okay engagement. Like I actually like, I know if you were to ask me for Alex, like how many likes is this going to get? I'll, I'll be able to, I would say within kind of like a 20% margin of error, say what it is. And the reason is, is because my goal for that piece of content isn't to drive engagement. It's actually to do something else. So I'll give you an example. Like yesterday, I tweeted something specific to the the media industry or the creator economy where I said um, that it's only a matter of time but before a there's a creator-led software brand. Um, what I mean by that is like you have a lot of physical creator-led brands, right? So you have, you know, The Rock and Terramana Tequila. You have um, you know, uh, Mr. Beast and you have Feastables. But I haven't seen any like creators launching software brands. And I think it's going to happen at some point because either a software company is going to go to a creator and literally give them enough equity to become the marketing channel for it, or a creator is going to bring on a technical co-founder and launch something themselves. All this to say, you know, with 215,000 followers, I know that less than probably 20% of my audience, right? So we're talking about 40,000 people actually, actually gives a shit about say digital media or like deep creator economy insights. But my view is that tweet, while it may not get a lot of engagement, it's going to get the right engagement. It's going to get the right eyeballs. And I actually, what I far, like far more value is someone DMing me after that tweet to have a conversation about my perspective on that. And so I say all that to say, like, actually, before, like, what we think of as, like, a uh, met engagement actually may not be met if we have an understanding of what our goals are. If we have, if we actually want something to kind of outperform and it doesn't perform great, honestly, the, the thing that I always do is, like, I have a group of people that I'm in a text group with, like, other people who have large audiences on Twitter, and I will very often go to them and say, hey guys, this did not perform nearly well enough or not as well as I thought it would. Wh what do you think is in landing right here? What is it about the hook that's off? What is it about the formatting that's wrong? Like, what what am I not, what am I missing here? Because I also know I'll think about it emotionally. Um, and so for example, uh, you know, I'll reach out to David Perel, who has a writing course. I'll reach out to Dickie Bush, who has shipped 30 for 30. And to me, those people will give the best feedback because they spend all of their waking hours thinking about how do you create the most uh, engaging content on Twitter, um, and they can think about it as a third party. I love the concept, and and I, f for Morning Brew specifically, I would say that you're at a point now where the vast majority is probably pretty high quality content within the specific newsletters. Uh, maybe it, maybe you feel it wasn't always that way, but you know, that definitely it back wasn't to always that way. <laughs> bringing it back to systems, you built systems. You've you've got ways of knowing things, ways to enable other people to create great content and things like that. So there's probably not tons of meh content going for there, but I, I think that it is more specific content. So one one thing that I would be interested to know from you is if you felt like if you told your team you wanted to try to make every single email more like viral content going forward instead of specific. What, what type of impact do you think that that would have on the business? Yeah, I mean, it's tough because it, I don't think news is inherently viral, right? So I think in order to create, if we truly wanted to create viral content, we'd have to steer away from news into things that uh, kind of are more like jaw-dropping. And so I think actually in trying to go viral, we'd actually lo like lose the core reason that we serve our audience, which is for them to know the most important stories that have happened in the business world over the last 24 hours. But what I will say with news is like, while it's not viral per se, there's inherent virality to it in the sense that new, because news is timely, because it has a shelf life that let's call it is 24 hours, there is natural urgency for people to consume your content because they know if they don't consume it soon, it won't be valuable to them after a number of hours. And so I would say that's the answer for email. Say for Morning Bruce Twitter, I think the risk you run is... Um, becoming one dimensional in your content as in to me 
kind of in our world, the most viral content I see is generally by like the FinTwit accounts, right? By like um, uh, Dr. Parikh Patel and by uh, John B or John W. Rich, like the yeah, you know the, the pseudonymous, yeah, the, yeah. the pseudonymous FinTwit accounts. Like I would say, they are the most viral accounts. I think the issue is, is if we were to kind of tell our team, hey, let's just like rip it like them and let's be exceptional at shit posting and uh, doing memes. I do think, and by the way, by the way, I don't think it's inherently bad, but I do think we would we would end up isolating a part of our audience that's kind of not on the inside joke of let's call it like financial markets and fin meme culture. For sure. Yeah. That's that's kind of what I anticipated too, that I I do believe negative impact across the board there. But um yeah. Well, you had mentioned something too that it's timely. A lot of the stuff that you do, most of the stuff that you do at Morning Brew, is that something you're conscious, consciously trying to mitigate? Like, are you trying to add any evergreen content in there? How? What's the split right now between what's just timely versus evergreen? Eighty percent of what's in Morning Brew right now is timely. Twenty percent is evergreen. Twenty percent is kind of like. Um, the news uh, adjacent stuff, the the games, uh, the um, the quizzes, the uh, we show a picture of a house, describe the house, and you have to guess the the value of the house at the bottom of the newsletter. And in terms of mitigating it, you know, we're not trying to mitigate it in the newsletter because, again, at the end of the day, with any content you create, I think it has to. Uh, serve a specific passion or solve a specific problem. And I think the problem we're solving is the the business pr- professional being caught off guard in a conversation with their boss or their peers. And we are solving the problem of that not happening. We are your insurance policy for not looking like a schmuck. Um, but outside of the newsletter, yeah, I think there's absolutely opportunity to create evergreen content. I, I would say actually that's very attractive to us, especially on say YouTube, as Morning Brew goes into creating more multimedia content with creators, um, I think having a good balance of evergreen content is really important because at the end of the day, you're playing with, let's call it the second largest search engine on the internet um, in, in YouTube. And so the ability to create content that continues to accrue views over time as people search for keywords related to what you're doing, I think is a huge asset. And to be honest, this is one of the difficulties I've found with podcasts because uh, my podcast Founders Journal, all of the basically all of the topics I talk about are evergreen in nature, right? So, like if I even just look at the episodes that we put out from the last week, um, most recent episodes were six uh, six steps for successful meetings because most people don't know how to how to have meetings. Uh, why following your passion is it bad advice? Um, how to build meaningful relationships and network in kind of the age of post COVID, how to get unstuck in your job. If you don't enjoy your job, how to get promoted faster, right? Like none of those have a short shelf life, but the issue is you don't get the benefit of that with podcasting because discoverability, finding those topics is impossible on podcast players. And so I think in a lot of ways, this is actually why the kind of strategy is changing where I think some of these topics would actually do far better either as web content or far better in kind of video form um, on YouTube. And so this is kind of one of, I would say, the the struggles of scaling a podcast. Podcasts are hard. <laughs> you, yeah, you don't have to tell me twice. I've tried building <laughs> a bunch of them and it's it's hard to grow. The discoverability is bad. The social aspect's really bad. So if, uh, if anybody can grow a podcast, kudos to them because it's it's not for the faint of heart and totally. it's hard to go viral. Um my my last little question for you here, just kind of wrapping everything up that we've talked about. We've talked about some of your personal stuff. We've talked a lot about Morning Brew as well. Two different sides of the same coin, really. But everybody is slowly coming around on the idea that every business kind of needs to be a media business now. Content's not just a fad. It's something you really need to build a structure around and everybody has to be doing this. Looking at what you know now, especially from Morning Brew, what are some of the favorite principles that you've learned from building a business brand that you have been applying to yourself or you would recommend applying to somebody else's personal brand? Yep, I would say um, there are infinite niches on the internet uh, and niches tend to be far larger than you think. Niche does not mean small, niche means specific. Um, 
humans resonate with humans. And so the more that you can put faces and individuals at the forefront of the brands you're building, even if you're a company brand, um, I think the, the better off you'll be. Uh, the, the, the least or the least, the less can't, can't speak the, uh, less promotional you can be about your content. Um, the better, especially as uh, a brand, you know, someone who I think has been doing a good job with their content is uh, mad happy, the apparel brand, uh, on TikTok. Um, most of their TikTok is clips from Mad Happy's podcast that talks about mental health um, with kind of well-known creators and influencers. And there really isn't anything promoting Mad Happy beyond uh, the co-founders who host the podcast just wearing Mad Happy swag. So I'd say like just create good content and kind of your prize for creating good content is people will look into who you are and want to support you. Um, and I would say the final piece is at the end of the day, it's like, good content talks and bullshit walks. And it is just like uh, with any company, if your product is mediocre, um, good marketing can cover it up for a period of time, but then you will start to hemorrhage customers because they will realize they don't like your product. And the same thing goes for content. If you have exceptional content, the nice thing is content is marketing. And so you'll be able to grow your audience if you have mediocre content, even with the best marketing, you will not be able to grow nearly as fast as you want to, and you'll not be able to retain your audience uh, nearly as well as you want to. So if there's one thing you focus on, it is being ruthlessly honest with yourself of, do we have best-in-class content? And do we think only we uniquely could have created that content or someone else was capable of doing it? Man, I, I've taken like, so many nuggets from this interview. So appreciate you coming on. I know that this is going to be a, a big hit with, with the listeners. So uh, floor is now yours. I want to give you a chance at the end here to just talk about what you're working on right now, what's top of mind for you in your life, and also where people can find you. Yeah. Um, well, uh, first of all, again, I appreciate you, you uh, for having me. Um, you can find me on uh, Twitter, on TikTok, on Instagram. Uh, my handle on Twitter and TikTok is Business Barista. My uh, handle on Instagram is Alex Lieb. I got to change it to Business Barista at some point. Um, and I would love for you to check out um, my podcast, uh, Founders Journal. It's made for um, entrepreneurs uh, and it's all about giving you tools and strategies to help you build your business better. And Imposters is for people who are interested in self-development, self-work, and mental health. Um, that is the focus of those conversations. Um, and I hope you enjoy it. Can't recommend the follow enough. Follow him, Alex Lieberman again. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks so much for having me.